Okay, so what we had been looking at last time was some basic ideas, and we want to continue that discussion. We had looked at this idea of economic goods and bads. We looked at uh, a discussion of positive and normative economics, and what we essentially said was that when we think about it, economics, is really a decision science where we're looking at how are we going to turn these resources into goods and services, right? So we had these things like our resources here. We had our goods and services. And we said, look, we know that these guys right here are limited and scarce. Therefore, we know that these guys right here are going to be scarce and limited. Okay. So what we want to do today is we want to look at what are these different resources that we consider, and then what are some important ideas to keep in mind, and then what are some ideas that we don't want to keep in mind. And I don't know that we'll get to the things we don't want to do. Uh, later today, but we might get to them on Monday. So let's look at these resources. Basically, we classify them into four different kinds here. Right? And our first one here is land, and you'll notice i got a little bit of space right here. So when we're talking about resource, the land being a resource, we don't actually mean that we have to actually physically be somewhere, although that is part of it. Right? So we're talking about all of the natural resources. Right, so we've got minerals, you know, forests, arable land, water, etc. Right. So in other words, if we're going to make something, we've got to be somewhere. And we're looking at those resources that are part of the land, we call that basically land. Our second one is labor. Right. So this is all of the physical. And mental talents of men and women. All right. So these are um, you know, football games by football players and uh, doctors and lawyers and car mechanics and janitors and computer guys, all this stuff. We've got capital. Right. And you can kind of think of capital as the manufactured aids in the production process. Now, if you're in an accounting class or a finance class, and somebody uses the word um, capital, what would they be referring to? Money, right? But capital is not money, right? Money is just a little green piece of paper that we use to facilitate trade. Money itself doesn't create anything. And when we talk about capital, it doesn't have to be <clears throat> the things that we can physically touch. A distribution network is a form of capital, right? So when we're looking at capital in the production of education, we've got boards and markers and desks and chairs and computers. All of those are examples of capital. Do you have a question? No. Oh, okay. Uh, and the fourth one here is entrepreneurship. All right. So the entrepreneur is the person that combines land, labor, and capital. Right, to create goods and services. Basically, somebody's going to be in charge. Somebody's going to come up with the ideas. Okay. So, remember what we said. Here's our four different classifications of, of resources. 
It's either going to be land, it's going to be labor, it's going to be capital, or we're going to call it entrepreneurship. These guys are limited and scarce. Infinite amount of land? No. Infinite amount of labor? No. Infinite amount of capital? No. Infinite amount of entrepreneurship? No. All of these guys are limited and scarce. Okay? So since these guys are limited and scarce, they need a factor payment. <coughs> Because land, labor, and capital and entrepreneurship don't have to do one particular thing. They can do lots of things. So let's look at um, land, for example. Right? right now we've got land. Missouri State University sits on some land. What else could that land be used for? Housing. So we've got some land here. MSU could be used for housing. So we'll tear this down and build homes. What else? Retail stuff. No, it could be anything. And do what with it? Forest for trees, for lumber. Or park. Don't have to tear it down at all. Right? Parks have value, right? Well, I like parks. Trees are good. Yada, 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 right? Could use it to grow wheat, potatoes, or whatever. So if we want land to not be used for housing, retail forests, to create lumber or to create a park, wheat, all this other stuff, we have to hire it away from those alternative uses, right? And what do you pay your landlord every month? Rent. That's the name of the factor payment for land. All right. Let's look at labor. How many of you guys have a job? Okay, what's your job? Uh, sales associate. Okay, so sales. What's your name? Joe. Joe. Okay, so is that the only thing you can do? There's nothing else in life you can do? No. Okay, so what are some other things you could do? Such as? Farming. Farming. I meant right now. Oh, right now? Yeah. Uh, just be a student, not employed. Labor-wise, there's only one thing you can do. You can't be a waiter. Could you be a waiter? Work in the kitchen at Chick-fil-A? Janitor? Um, daycare, All right? That'll make you want to not have kids. <laughs> yada, 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 right? So here's what Joe's doing, and there's a list of stuff that Joe could do. If the company he works for wants him to do that and to not be a waiter, they're going to have to hire him away from these alternative uses, right? Because he has lots of alternative uses. So what do you think the name to the factor payment for labor is? What do you think we call that? Wages. What do you think is true about this factor payment relative to the amount of other things that they can do? And I'll give you an example. My brother is a high school dropout and a convicted felon. We'll get to that a lot later on. That's not necessarily true. Here we've got two different people. We've got person A, we've got person B. Person A, no high school, high school dropout. Person B, college grad. Felon not felon, drug addict, 
shows up to work. How many alternative uses are there for this person? Not very many, right? My brother did not complete high school. He's a convicted felon. He has serious drug and alcohol problems. He cannot show up to work on time. That's really hard for him, getting up in the morning and doing stuff. So, sales job, we need you here at 8 o'clock. Can you be here at 8 o'clock? Um, maybe. Can't do that, can't do farming, right? Cows want to be fed, pigs want to be fed, waiter, cook. The list of stuff he could do is pretty small. The list of stuff this person could do, relatively larger, right? Ceteris so paribus, keeping everything else constant, this factor payment that this person's going to receive is going to be smaller than this one, right? There are fewer alternative uses for your labor. And since there's fewer people competing for your labor, the size of that factor payment is a whole lot smaller. Capital. Let's look at a, our building here. We've got our strong hall. It's a piece of capital. Right now it's being used to produce education. What else could it be used for? Yes. TV and radio. So we could use it for TV and radio production. What else? <coughs> Would you guys want to live in this room? You could. So we'll say homes. Put a daycare in here. Yeah, totally. Uh, could you assemble computers in the building? Yada, 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 right? So here's our factor, right, capital. And if it has lots of different alternative uses, its factor payment's going to tend to be relatively high. If it has few alternative uses, the factor payment tends to be relatively low. What does your bank pay your savings account? Interest. Interest. Finally, you come to entrepreneurship. This is the person that combines land, labor, and capital and says, you know, I need some land. And I'm going to combine that with a building. And I'm going to combine that with some labor, and I'm going to produce and assemble computers. All right. And in essence, the factor payment that the entrepreneur gets is called profit. All right. So the more alternative uses the, these resources have, the higher the factor payment. The fewer alternative uses, uh, the fewer alternative uses that they have. Right. Typically speaking, the lower the factor payment, right? Or if what they can produce isn't very high valued, then the factor payment tends to be relatively small. Have you guys ever flown in an airplane out to like California and you fly over the desert west and you look out the plane window and what do you see? Desert. You see brown. There's nothing to look at, right? Can't grow anything on it. If there's not minerals there, the, the land is worthless. Right. So these factor payments are a reflection of the alternative uses from these different resources and the things that those resources can make. Okay. So let's look at some ideas that we want to keep in mind when we're doing economics. Right. So here are some important ideas that we've got.
And this first one here is probably one of the most important. That's the idea of opportunity cost. Okay. So the definition is pretty long, so I'm going to read it rather than writing it out, so I don't have to erase all that. So I'm going to read it to you several times, okay? So opportunity cost is using resources to produce one good. Using resources to produce one good diverts those resources away from the production of alternative goods. Using resources to produce one good <coughs> diverts those resources away from the production of alternative goods. These alternative goods that are sacrificed to create the original good is the opportunity cost of the original good. These alternative goods that are sacrificed to create the original good is the opportunity cost of producing the original good. So once again, using resources to produce one good diverts those resources away from the production of alternative goods. These alternative goods that are sacrificed to create the original good is the opportunity cost of creating the original good. You can see why I didn't want to write all that out. Using resources to produce one good diverts those resources away <coughs> from the production of alternative goods. <coughs> These alternative goods that are sacrificed to create the original good is the opportunity cost of creating the original good. Okay, so on this side we've got a butterfly. This side I got a fish. Okay. If I cut out the fish to put them on my wall, what's the opportunity cost? The butterfly. If I cut out the butterfly to put them on my wall, what's the opportunity cost? The fish. All right. This is why I hate technology. It'll take too long to get the Elmo up and running to show you this. So I'm going to show you this. What is that, Joe? Uh, tree transplant. It's a tree, right? So there's this giant tree here, okay? And it's kind of hard to tell. Can you see that there's a space underneath there? They're lifting this tree up, okay? So they got this giant tree. You guys have seen them do this, I'm assuming, right? So here's this giant tree. You can kind of see it here. Here's the tree, and then here's this, and there's some workers right here underneath it. Okay? So let's read what this says. When a big chain store, let's face it, we all know who the big chain store is, wanted to build a certain, on a certain lot in uh, Arbondale, Florida, a 120-year-old oak stood in the way. Rather than cutting it down, the retailer paid more than $100,000 to have the tree transplanted. A practice that's becoming more common as municipalities require developers to preserve tree canopy. Uh, saving trees creates positive publicity and attracts crowds to come to watch the process. Just like the circus came to town. Uh, the Arbondale Oaks move took six weeks of preparation, the uncovering and trimming its 42 foot wide root ball. The mover slid steel rods underneath, which you can see above, and the 353 ton tree was lifted onto a trailer for transport to its new home 500 yards away in a wetland preservation area. So far, the old tree is doing just fine. All right. Okay, so $100,000 to move the tree. What is the opportunity cost of this guy. And don't think in terms of like medicine and things like that. That's obvious. Oh, we could have saved 100,000, you know, we could have vaccinated 50 kids, or which you could have done, or whatever the number is. They're doing it for environmental reasons. What could the $100,000 have done environmentally speaking? 
How much do trees cost at Home Depot and Lowe's? Ten bucks? Does that sound about right? What's going to have more tree canopy? One tree or 10,000 trees that got planted? You see what I'm saying? This is what we mean by opportunity cost. And it's not that necessarily saving the trees is a bad thing. I mean, maybe they signed the Florida Constitution underneath it or whatever. But it doesn't say anything about that, right? It's just a tree. If you're going to spend $100,000 to save one tree and you're interested in tree canopy, I'm not saying the tree canopy is a bad thing. The tree canopy is a good thing. But you could have taken this $100,000 and used it to plant a whole bunch of different trees and created a whole lot more tree canopy than saving the one tree. Right. Or we could have used $100,000 to vaccinate kids or build homes or education for somebody, blah, 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 right? There was a whole bunch of these other things that you could have done. What about you guys? If you were not here right now, what would you be doing? Sleeping. Or working. Or TV. Time with boyfriend slash girlfriend, yada, 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 all right? Your opportunity cost for being here is this highest valued alternative, right? Here's all the alternative things that you could be doing. And the opportunity cost says, not here's all the things I could be doing. Opportunity cost is all these things. Opportunity cost is the highest valued alternative. Because you can't do sleeping, working, TV, time with boyfriend, girlfriend, and being here all at the same time, right? We can't both save the tree and plant 10,000 trees, right? Or save the tree and vaccinate the kids, save the tree and have the free college education for 10 people, or save the tree and build two homes, or whatever it is. So we're here, we're looking at our highest valued alternative. That's what we're looking at when we're looking at this idea of opportunity cost. And since by definition every single choice has at least, uh, every single decision that we make has at least two different choices, otherwise it's not a decision. Every single decision that we make by definition has to have an opportunity cost. You can't get away from it. Clear? Very important concept. It doesn't go away. It's a way of thinking. You have to learn up. You have to think about it. It's not something that you just answer on a test. It's a way of thinking about the world. Number two. People know that resources are scarce and therefore they will attempt to economize. People know that resources are scarce and they will attempt to economize. So what we mean by this is that given a set of choices that have equal cost, 
we're going to choose the one that has the greatest benefit. Or, given a set of choices that have equal benefit, we're going to choose the one that has the lowest cost. Right? So, let's assume that you guys don't get into football games for free. You've got to pay. Uh, the game takes about two hours. A movie takes about two hours. It costs basically the same. So you've got about two hours worth of time and 10 bucks to get into the movies, two hours worth of time and 10 bucks to get into a football game. What this guy says is really, really simple. Hey, these guys both cost the same. And it says, if I'd rather go to the movies than go to the football game, I will do what? Go to the movies. If I would rather go to the football game, I will go to the football game. Very, very simple. We could also, like I said, we got two different choices that have equal benefit. Right, we're going to choose the one that has the lowest cost. So you can have two different jobs. You're working at, say, McDonald's. Right, and you can work at the one here in Springfield, or you can work at the one in Rolla. Right, and if you live in Springfield, and they both pay the same. The pay's not different. It's the same cute guy or girl that you get to work with, the same crappy customers. It's all the same. What this guy says is that given a choice of working at the Springfield McDonald's or working at the Rolla McDonald's, if I live in Springfield and they both pay the same and they both have the same cute guy or girl and they both have the same crappy customers, which one am I going to work at? Springfield. Why? You got gas money? Time, wear and tear on your car, etc. right? They both have the same benefit, same paycheck size, but this one has a higher cost, both in terms of gas and time and wear and tear on my car. Number three, incentives will alter people's behavior. If your grade in this class was determined by chance, I'm just going to pick your name out of a hat at the end of the semester and assign you a random grade, A, B, C, D, or F, what incentive would you have to show up? None, right? But your grade is dependent upon how well you do on tests, homeworks, and quizzes. You have an incentive to come to class and show up. And this works not only for things like class, but other things. Like, so for example, in the former Soviet Union, when I was growing up, it wasn't Russia, it was the Soviet Union. All right? The Soviet Union, they would tell people, make this stuff. Here's the stuff, make it under these, spec under these uh, specifications. And so they had a windshield maker. And so the windshields are, of course, the things that go in your car. And they said, OK, we're going to pay you on the basis of weight. Right. How can you get glass to be heavy? Thicker. Thicker right? And in fact, what they would do is they would make some windshields that were three feet thick. Because that's how they got paid. Can you have a three foot thick windshield? No. That's stupid. So Stalin takes these group out, shoots them, puts in another group. Says, okay, weight doesn't work. We're going to pay on the basis of area. Here's the stuff you need to make windshields. We're going to pay you on the basis of area. Now, what did they do? They made them really thin. This was a three foot thick windshield. Right? Here's the stuff to make windshields. Based upon the area of the windshields, I'm going to make my windshields really, 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 really thin. All right. So they put in these really thin windshields. People are driving down the street in their cars. Rocks are coming up like they always do. They hit the windshields. And for us, it's like, oh, nuts. 
Is there a little scratch there? No, no, I look out, yay. For them, rocks are popping up. The windshields are so thin, they're breaking. People are getting cut with glass at 50 miles an hour. Oh, I'm bleeding out. Stalin takes that group out, shoots them. All right? Incentives are going to alter people's behavior. They were paid on the basis of weight or area. They made three-foot thick windshields. They made really, really, really thin windshields. All right. Number four. Economic agents make decisions at the margin. All right? Every time you see the word an economic agent, that's just a decision-making unit. That's all that that is. People, households, firms, governments, etc. Bless you. What we mean here by the margin is people examine the marginal benefits versus the marginal costs. And every time you see the word marginal benefits or marginal costs, you can substitute in your mind the word additional. So let's think about what this guy says. He says, we want to look at the additional benefits and the additional cost of doing something. And essentially what this means is that if the marginal benefits are greater than the marginal cost, then we want to do it. Right? If the marginal costs are greater than the marginal benefits, then we don't want to do it. Basically, you want to do it up until these guys are equal to each other. Okay? So let's think about what this means. In class, you've got a grade. What percentage-wise grade should you shoot for in this class? OK, and what percentage gets you that? 90. Why not shoot for 100%? You know you're not close to exactly. How much effort does it take to get a 90%? Some amount, all right, whatever that is. Here's the amount of effort that it takes. It takes X amount. How much effort does it take a 100%? Not 10% more. What do you have to do to get a 100% in a class? Everything has to be completely right every single time. You can't miss a single test question. You can't miss a single question on a quiz. You can't miss a single homework. You get every single homework perfect. Is that more than 10% effort at 90%? You guys think so? You guys think it's only 10% more effort to go from a 90 to a 100%? 100%. 100% in your college algebra class. Every single homework completely correct every single time, every single test. You think the amount of time that it takes to study? Here's your study time. To get a 90, that's some amount of time for the semester, whatever it is. I'm making up a number, 100 hours. You think it's only 10 more hours to go from a 90% to a 100% in college algebra? No. Do you think it's only 10 more hours to go from a 90% to a 100% in economics? No. no. It's a whole lot more effort. The marginal costs 
are huge. And what's the marginal benefit? Nothing. Because this guy gets an A, and that guy gets an A. And in fact, if you said to yourself, I'm going to get a 100% in Dr. Mitchell's class because I want to get a 100%, that's fine. I don't care. But what happens to your grade in biology? Your um, sociology class and your anthropology class, your religious studies class, what do you have to do? Give up time to study for them, which means those grades will probably do what? Fall. How much effort is that? Zero to ten percent. You know how you know how to get a zero. That's easy. How do you get a zero? Don't do anything. How do you get a ten percent in class? Barely do anything. Is this ten percent hard? This 10% is easy, right? This 10% is I'm not even going to study for the test. I'm going to randomly put in stuff. Statistically speaking, you should at least get a 25% in a class if there's four questions, four answers on each of the test questions, right? Statistically speaking. So this 10% right here, the first 10%, that's easy, all right? The marginal costs of the first 10%, no problem. The marginal costs of the last 10%, very difficult. So what this guy says is that people should make decisions at the margin. They should examine the marginal benefits and the marginal costs. All right? We'll look at this guy. We'll see this guy a whole lot. Number five. Information is important, but it's costly to obtain. Why would we need information? Exactly. Very good. So we need information to help us make better decisions, right? We want to know, what do I do? Do I do A, do I do B, or do I do C? Information helps us know which one of those to do. And it helps us to know what the marginal benefits are and what the marginal costs are. So how much information should we obtain? And be careful in your answer. Essentially, yes. We should collect information until the marginal benefits of collecting more information equal the marginal cost of collecting more information. So let's use a couple of examples to kind of illustrate what we mean by that, because I was like, what do you mean by that? That doesn't make sense. You're in St. Louis. You're driving around. You need gas. Do you pull over to the side of the road, call every single gas station in the greater St. Louis metropolitan statistical area to see who has the cheapest gas? Because that's full information. you now know who has the cheapest gas. Is that what people typically do? No. They drive around, they see a couple of stations, two or three maybe, and then they make their decision from that, right? They don't have, by definition, they do not have full information. But the marginal cost of collecting all of that information on all of these different gas stations 
is relatively large. All right? And so we can see here the marginal cost of collecting information on all gas station prices is larger than the marginal benefit. Right? Because they're only going to vary by a couple of cents one way or the other anyway. Maybe 10 cents. Maybe. So if your gas tank holds 20 gallons, you're talking about two bucks. Right? Is it worth being on the phone all day long with every single gas station in the greater St. Louis metropolitan statistical area to save two dollars? Probably not. Right? So we're going to collect information up until the point where the marginal benefits of collecting more information is equal to the marginal cost of collecting more information. You can do the exact same thing with restaurants. You and your friends want to go out to a restaurant. Which restaurant do you go to? Right? You need information. Who's got what meals? Who's got what prices? Is the food good? Stuff like that. The problem is, how do you get full information on every single one of these restaurants. You can't necessarily, right? So is it possible that you can go to the wrong restaurant? Totally, right? Because if you think about it, you want to say to yourself, I need to collect as much information on the local restaurants here to determine where to eat. And I know from Dr. Mitchell's class that the marginal cost of collecting all that information is going to be really, really high. The marginal benefits of collecting information will be really, really low. So I don't collect all of the information. But I actually need information on the marginal cost of collecting information and the marginal benefit of collecting information. You see what I'm saying? So you've got the information here on the restaurants. Here's the full information on the restaurants. How do you know you've collected information to where the marginal benefits of more information is equal to the marginal cost of more information? You see what I'm saying? You see the problem? I know I need to collect information. I know the marginal benefits of more information and the marginal cost of more information need to be equal. However, I need information on what is the marginal benefits of collecting more information, and I need information on what is the marginal cost of collecting more information. You see what I'm saying? Which means, of course, you need information on the marginal benefits of collecting information to collect the marginal benefits of more information. You see what I'm saying? So it's possible that you're going to make mistakes. Going to a restaurant that serves bad food is not an example that capitalism is horrible. It's a problem of information. It's a problem of collecting the information. Right? You're going to choose bad meals. You're going to go to the gas station that charges the higher price. It's just going to happen. You're not always going to be able to have and do the most efficient solution, right? Because knowing what the most efficient answer is, knowing this guy right here, just think of it like a bullseye. Here's your bullseye. I'll tell you what, let's do it this way. Here's your barn. Here's your bullseye. Got any bow hunters? How hard is it to hit the barn? Not hard at all. All right? True? Anybody could do it? Okay. We don't, are not interested in hitting up here. 
we're interested in hitting here. As we get closer and closer and closer to trying to hit this guy right here, how much harder does it get? It gets harder? Yeah. The person who's never shot a bow in their life can do this. The person who says, wow, I really missed the target. I'm going to work at it. Right? I'm going to expend energy trying to figure this out. Marginal cost. Marginal benefit. Hey, I'm getting closer. Marginal benefit, getting closer. Marginal benefit, getting closer. Right? You can make the bullseye be as small as you want it to be. Do you see what I'm saying? It could be you must be within two millimeters of this point. How hard would it be to get within two millimeters of a point? Very hard. It's going to take a lot of practice. But you can get to the point where does it matter if you're within two, if you're on a deer, deer? Do you have to be within two millimeters of where you want to be? No, right? You can be a little bit off and still get enough of the deer debt, right? It doesn't have to be exactly <laughs> two millimeters, right? You can be off by a couple of inches and you're okay. The deer's like, hey, this sucks. I got an arrow in me. It's the same thing here, right? The marginal cost of going from here to here is pretty small. The marginal benefits are really big. As you get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, the marginal cost gets higher and higher and higher, and the marginal benefits getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You're off by a smaller and smaller function, right? So it's the exact same thing here with information. The problem is, of course, if this is your target, how much marginal benefit does it take to get from here to get to here? What's the marginal cost? How much training does it take to get from here to get to here? I don't know. And sometimes that itself needs information. We are done. OK, we'll pick it up with uh, economic actions generating long-term effects. So read this handout that I passed out. Deals with essentially opportunity costs. I will see you guys on Monday.